A long time ago, there were these two ladies. They're Sichonghu Lakota people. Today, their descendants live on the Rosebud Sioux Reservation and the Lower Brule Sioux Reservation. These are Sichonghu Lakota people. A long, 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 long time ago, their two Sichonghu ladies were standing on a hill and they were saying, E, look at that. Look at that star. See, it's pretty. And the other lady said, Oh, look at that other one. That one's even prettier. So that first lady said, No, that's not that pretty. <laughs> They're just teasing each other, yeah? <laughs> I think I'll marry that one. They were just you know, having fun like that. And here, suddenly, they saw a light coming from the sky. And this light landed near them. And here, there was some kind of object they'd never seen before. And they were, like, scared at first. And here, there was some men that came up. They motioned those ladies to come over. And they were able to understand each other. And they had a talk for quite a while. And here, these men, they were talking about what it's like, where they come from. And so these men, Ask them, do you want to come with us? Do you want to see what it's like? And so they said, yeah. So they went up there, and it was really nice. And the men asked them if they would like to stay there. And if not, they'll bring them back. The people were just friendly up there. So they said, we'll stay here for a while. So they said, okay. In time, they fell in love with each other and they married these men and they started to have family and here one marriage was really good the man was really a good man he was a good father to the children but the other one changed the man was kind of mean he was abusive and so she wanted to go back And she was just now pregnant, and she was going to have her first child. And she didn't want her child to have such a mean father. So she wanted to return. So one day she was going out. He wouldn't take her back, for one thing. So one day she was going out to pick some turnips that they have up there in the star world. And here, this one... It had a really long root, the timsila. That's what they call it. The timsila up there really had a long, long root. And so she had to dig and dig and dig and dig. And here, after she pulled that plant out, here she saw that there's a hole going down. So she lowered herself down. And she looked down that hole and here she saw her home. She saw the earth. So she climbed back up and she thought, ah, this is my way now. So she, what she did was she she decided to dig as much team sila as she could because up there they had really, really long roots. So when she did that, she braided them together and it made an r- incredibly long rope. So she uh, one day it was a, she felt it was enough to get her back to the earth. So she hid it under a rock. Her husband wouldn't find it. Then that day came for her to make her escape. By that time, she's really showing now. Her pregnancy is really, she's about ready to give birth and she wants, she doesn't want to have the baby there. So she's moving as fast as she can. So then she starts to go down this rope. Then she lowers, she goes to that hole and she she always tells her husband she's going looking for Team Sina. And She brings some back, but most of it she makes for that rope. So this way he won't get suspicious. But he's thinking, why is she always going out for Timsila? Why is she always gone all day long, but she just brings back a tiny little bit? And they're really small. And uh, so he decides to check up on her and, and see what is she doing. So he goes to looking for her. And then he finds that hole. He looks down there. And here, that lady is going down that rope. She's going back to the earth. 
these timsila have really long roots, so what she was doing was tying them together. And that's what made that rope. So she was going there. She was almost to the earth when he found her and started to pull up that rope. And she was almost at the earth. And she didn't want to go back. She didn't want to live a life of constant abuse. She didn't want her child to watch her get beat up. She didn't want her to see her child get beat up because she didn't want her child to believe that that is what love is because that isn't. All these thoughts were in her mind and she let go of the rope. So she fell to the earth in this area, this kind of a sacred area since then. It's located in the Black Hills of South Dakota today. Uh, no trees grow there, by the way. But that's not the reason why. The reason why no trees go there is because of something else that happened earlier, millions of years earlier, where the wolves slaughtered the first humans that came on the earth out of Wind Cave. The humans were told by a man to gather there for a feast. And all that time, they were the feast. The wolves almost exterminated the humans, the first humans on the earth. But the humans managed to escape. And so there were you know, hundreds of thousands of humans that were slaughtered in that area. And the wolves just went crazy because they really liked human blood. And that point at which they went crazy, an energy went into their hair. And so this is why little children are not supposed to touch wolf fur, because that energy is generational. It's always in their fur. So a woman in her childbearing years shouldn't handle it, because maybe she's pregnant. It's not showing yet. So... She shouldn't handle it either because it also can hurt the unborn child. So it's because of that incident that nobody lived there. It's a beautiful area in the Black Hills. But because of that first incident with the wolves annihilating the humans, this is what happened. That's why it's a sacred area and that you don't go there to live. So that's the first reason why it's a sacred area. And this is why wolves and Lakota people are enemies. We do not identify with the wolves. The humans, they were saved by the buffalo people. The buffalo give us our homes, our clothes, our tools, even our toys, our cooking utensils, things to use for our clothes, brushing our hair, all these kind of things. We're supposed to use every part of the buffalo that we can. We're not supposed to waste it. And when we take a buffalo, we have to give something back. So when we go hunting, we say a prayer, an apology, and we make a vow that if we get something, we will give something back too of ourselves. So when we kill a buffalo, it's done ceremoniously. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the people. There's another ceremony done, like a funeral for that buffalo, and then they apologize again. And then they make a vow that they will feed everybody and use everything. And they only take what they need. And then they give something back from themselves to the Buffalo Nation. We reciprocate. So this is our way of hunting. It's a traditional way. Of course, nobody does this anymore, but that's what we used to do. And so when the buffalo came on the earth, we saw how they organized. And they organized in a community thinking perspective. No one leader. They have a group of leaders. And we saw that and we're like, that was really good the way they did that. We did the same thing. We copied the Buffalo people. So we organized the same way. So traditional government does not have one leader over the people. Every family is represented in the traditional government. 
So our perspective is a community perspective, community thinking perspective. The wolf perspective is something different. The wolf perspective is dualistic. And the buffalo perspective is not. So our ancestors identified with the buffalo, not the wolf. And uh, what happens to the buffalo happens to humans and vice versa. So that story says that humans and buffalo evolved from the same creature called Pte Oyate. A lot of people think that Pte Oyate means buffalo people or buffalo nation, but no, it doesn't. Pte is not human and it's not animal. It's something different, but it has the form of a human. And the first group that came on the earth, they became human. So they're called Ikje Oyate. They're not called Lakota. They're called Ikje. Now, if you're a man, you're Ikje Wichasha. If you're a woman, you're Ikje Wia. But the nation is Ikje Oyate. That's a human nation. The word Lakota, they didn't even use that yet. That comes millions of years later. And when the second group came out on the earth, they changed to the buffalo people. So they were called Pstechchaka Oyate. Chatanka means buffalo bull. It doesn't mean buffalo. Pstechchaka is buffalo. So this area in the Black Hills, the one reason why it's sacred is because when the first humans came, they were slaughtered by the wolves, then the buffalo came to save them. That's one reason why it's sacred, and they're not supposed to live there. Then later on, we did a ceremony there, once a year, just once a year. And it's called calling back the animals and flowers that were asleep during the winter. That's the only ceremony that was done there. That energy is still there from that slaughter. And the wolves still carry that energy in their hair. They came to slaughter. That's why it's duality. And when the buffalo people saved us, see, they developed that community perspective. And so we adopted that. And that's how we stayed away from duality in the beginning. But millions of years later, we became like the wolves. And the earth said, nope. We're not going to have any of that. And she cleansed herself. We tried to control the earth. And she said, no, that's not going to happen. And she did a cleansing of the earth. This race around the Black Hills talks about how the earth was when it was just one continent and what happened and how people became corrupt and dualistic and only a handful of humans lived that buffalo perspective or star knowledge perspective. And those are the only ones that were saved because when you live this community way of thinking, you're communicating from your sacred center. And that's where you hear the earth telling you where to go for safety. But when you communicate as your nationality, then you have a problem. That people who do that don't hear the earth's voice telling them what to do. That's in Lakota Star Knowledge. Lakota Star Knowledge is trying to teach the world be human. Don't be German. Don't be Japanese. Don't be Lakota. Don't be Apache. Be human. The earth sees you as human. That's what Lakota Star Knowledge is trying to teach. Anyway, back to the story. So this lady fell in that same area. And when she fell, she hit really hard and her baby was born soon after that. Then this old couple, these are metal art. Metal arcs are really have a beautiful song when they sing. And whenever they come, you know that winter is over. They're the first birds that arrive from the south to let people know the wind, the snow is done. Winter is over. So it really makes people happy. Yeah, I remember watching my mom when she said, what, what is that? She opened the windows. Oh, they're back. She said, gee, that makes me feel good. It's not going to snow anymore, she said. <laughs> they have a song, and they speak Lakota. 
the song says, It goes like that. <laughs> the buffalo calf liver is really delicious. Yeah? <laughs> That's a delicacy among our people. Buffalo calf liver. When you eat that, it makes you just feel good. And the medlarks make you feel just good too, just hearing their song. So that's why they sing that song. <laughs> they want the people to feel good. That happens in the springtime. So these two medlark birds, this old couple, they went to see this baby and they transformed themselves into human. And they talk with this lady. And this lady said, could you please raise my baby boy? I'm not going to make it. I'm pretty beat up inside. I'm going to die soon. Please raise my, my son. And the old couple said, yes, we will. And we always wanted a grandson, they said. So they promised her. And she named him Wichachmihichbaye, Fallen Star. That's his name. So they raised him. And he grew really fast, physically and emotionally and mentally and spiritually. He really grew. See, remember his father is from a different world where things happen faster. So he went around always helping people. and He really got a reputation of just being a nice guy. Everybody liked it when he came around. He's always doing things for people, good things. And here one time, he went to this camp, his mother, Sichonghu. So he went to another Sichonghu camp, and here there was something going on, and it looked like trouble. So he ran over there as fast as he could. And he got there, and he said, what's happening? So one of the chiefs came out, and he had no arm. One of his arms was missing. His right arm was missing. And it was this big wound there. He said, some star men came and they took my arm. Which was a young man at this time. I'll say fallen star. Okay, so you know who that is. So fallen star asked the chief, what happened? He said, well, we always have an agreement with these people. Every year, they come to get something from us. And they give us gift in return. And this year, I wanted to trick them. So they gave us their gift, but we didn't give them anything. So they took my arm. I'm really sorry. I wish I never did that. He was kind of like, I learned my lesson, you know, like that. He was very remorseful. So Fallen Star said, I can help you get your arm back. But you have to promise never to do this again. And the chief said, yeah, I will. He said, I will promise. I promise, he said. So Fallen Star, remember, he's half star man. So he was able to get back to where his father's world is. So he went back there. And he started to look for this chief's arm. Because this just happened. So he went up there. And he was going around from village to village. And here he saw this one teepee and he noticed that there were three old men there. They were sitting in front of the teepee. And then he noticed they're blind. They couldn't see. He was just watching, observing them. So he thought, oh, I wonder if they need any help. So he went over there they sensed he was there. So they're saying, Ransom, who are you? Where are you from? Fallen Star said, My father is from here. And the old men said, Yes, but there's something strange about you. And so then the Fallen Star glanced into the teepee and here he saw that chief's arm hanging on one of the teepee poles. These old guys get ready to eat it. <laughs> Fallen Star said, I really haven't eaten in a long time. So the grandfather said, Come with us. He said, We're just about ready to eat soup. Come and eat with us. So Fallen Star went inside. They are sitting around. 
So the fallen star said, I'll serve you. So the old man said, gee, you're a nice guy. Whoever raised you taught you well. Fallen star said, thank you. I was raised by my grandparents. And so then they got that container to serve the soup. What he did was he put soup in the bowl. He made the sound. And then he threw the soup in one of the old men's faces. Then he tipped the pot of soup over so that it spilled on the other two. And then he grabbed that arm and ran out of there. And those old men were screaming in pain. And Fallen Star was running and running and running. And he was able to get back to the earth. Remember, he's half Star Man. So he got back to the earth and he attached that arm back to the chief. The chief was really happy. So the chief said, if you would like to, maybe one of my daughters would like to marry you. Fallen Star said, I'm too young. I don't want to get married yet. But we have to get ready. He said, the star people are going to come. And they're going to be angry. So you have to apologize. And I'll be here with you and I'll talk on your behalf because my father is from there. Sure enough. Here come these lights from the sky. And they're coming really fast. And then they land in front of the people. These men get up. And so Fallen Star goes up to them. And they recognize that he's part Star Man. So Fallen Star asks them, please don't hurt them. He said, the chief made a mistake. And he's very sorry for what he did. And the old men that I killed, he said, they were going to eat his arm. That is not our way. We don't eat our own. So the star people said, yeah, that's correct. So they said, okay, we will not destroy the people, but they have to do something every year. And they have to do this a certain way. And If somebody did it correct, then we're going to send a signal. And it happens in the end of September. You see the signal in the stars every year. I said, when you see that signal, that means somebody did it right. But if you don't see that signal, nobody did it right. If you don't see that signal in the stars in September, that means nobody did it right. Then this agreement is over. So this was a peace treaty kind of thing. So Fallen Star says, we agree. We'll do this. And I will teach them what they have to do. The ceremony has to do with the cycle of a man. So, what Fallen Star taught them was the sun dance ceremony. This is a ceremony that is only supposed to be done by men because it has to do with the cycle of a man. And also women who've passed through menopause can participate in this. The reason why is because of another Lakota Star knowledge story in which women were gifted with three additional stages of development. In the beginning, all humans had four stages of development. But the son, who is male, he made a mistake, and it really violated his wife, who was the moon. And because of that, they were divorced, and the moon fell. It says the sun used to travel with the moon. That means the moon used to go around the sun. But when this incident happened, the moon fell away. Something from the sun hit the moon, and the moon fell away. This is why the dark side of the moon is damaged. This is where that happened. And the love of the earth caught the moon and nourished her back to well-being. So the earth and the moon are sisters. The earth is female, too. So when that happened, All women kind received 
three additional stages of development. So now women were above men. Then later in time, men were given three ceremonies to come into balance with women. And the sun dance is one of those ceremonies. So when I say the sun dance is only for men, it doesn't mean that men are better. It means the opposite. It means that men have to do this ceremony to come back into balance with women. Because when a woman is in her menstruating years, there's a power in there that we don't have. There's a power in their bodies that we don't have. So we have to do the ceremony to balance that out. So when a woman who is still menstruating does the ceremony, that means that she's taking her heart out and throwing it on the ground. She doesn't care. So she's destroying the nation. This is a Lakota perspective. This is not the feminist women's lib perspective. When you look at the Lakota ways, you have to look at it through Lakota eyes and not Western eyes or Christian eyes or feminist eyes or male chauvinist eyes. You have to look at it through Lakota eyes. When I was younger, in my 20s, several times in my life, I heard old women say, the day that a woman can do a sun dance is the day that a man can have a baby. They're exactly correct. These ceremonies are not for women because they already have something in their bodies that we don't have. So that's why we have to do those ceremonies. The other two ceremonies are the sweat lodge ceremony and the crying for a vision, or some people incorrectly call that vision quest. These are not necessary for women because there's something equivalent already inside women. And when they live healthy, they can use it. But when they don't live healthy, then that doesn't work. But that doesn't mean they're supposed to be in a ceremony either. Because it is in them. They just have to live healthy, emotionally healthy. It's not enough to just be physically healthy or spiritually or mentally healthy. You have to be emotionally healthy. You have to be all four. So women have seven stages of development and we just have four. So this is why the numbers four and seven are sacred to our people. And this is the reason why men have to do these three ceremonies to come into balance with women. And this is not something you brag about. The only people that need to know are your family and friends. And this is not something you talk about over the internet. You don't put this on your Facebook profile. Because if you do that, then you don't believe in the ceremony. If you believe in the ceremony, you know that you don't talk about it. It's not a secret. It's just not for the public. This is wakha. This is sacred. And when you put it on your Facebook profile, you're making it common. You're violating the ceremony. You're violating the pipe. When you get up and make speeches and say, you're a sun dancer and pipe carrier, you already violated the pipe. You violated the ceremony too. Because you're using that as a way to say to others that you are an authority figure. This is something called a fallacy. This is what lawyers use. The used car salesmen use this too. It's called appeal to authority fallacy. This is not our way. That's dualistic because you're trying to get others to see you as above them. And that's not our way. A true sun dancer and pipe carrier sees himself as a servant to the people. It's the opposite. When you see a man say that he's a sun dancer and a pipe carrier, he's a dualistic man. He's not healthy emotionally. And if a woman says she's a sun dancer and she has not passed through menopause yet, that's a crazy woman or a misinformed woman. These are really ancient laws that most people don't know. 
So today you see women out there in a Sundance circle and they're young women and they're not supposed to be out there. And it's not because they're less than. I'll say it one more time. Women have seven stages of development. Men have four. For men to come back into balance with women, we have to do these three ceremonies. This is the reason why. So it's not because women are less than, it's because men are. (laughs) And that's why we have to do these. So these are things that were taught by the fallen star. So when the ceremony is done the way he taught, then in September you see that constellation that's called the Hand Constellation. You see it come up in September. End of September or beginning of October, it comes up. And that's when they know, ah, whew, we're here for another year. <laughs> You see what I mean? (laughs) That's where this comes from. And it's supposed to be done at summer solstice. The ceremony is 12 days long. Four days are for the public. Eight days are for the dancers alone. Four days before the dancing, sun dancers will come together and they separate themselves from their families they're going to begin to go into a certain state of mind by going into sweat lodge ceremonies and praying and singing and getting themselves ready. We're doing this for the people so that we may live. That's the number one reason. And then every dancer has his own reason. Maybe he's dancing for somebody who's sick. Maybe he survived an illness that almost killed him. So he's dancing for Thanksgiving. Maybe he has a special, special question, and he's dancing for that. Everybody has their own special reason. But number one, you dance so that people may live. So four days before the dancing starts, they separate themselves from their family, and they're going to get into the mindset of the ceremony now, because this is a very, very solemn time. So the family stay away from their dancers. They stay away from them too. So then, on the fourth day of preparation, it's called tree day. That's when they select the tree and they bring it into the sendat circle. Now I'm going to go fast here, okay? I'm not going to give you step by step because there might be some new ager listening to this show, writing this all down so they can do one. And this show is not about that. So I'm just going to explain the basic concepts here. Because there's a whole ceremony involving the picking of the tree, the cutting it down, the carrying it. There's a bunch of songs for that. I'm not going to talk about that. I'll just say what happens in general. They take the tree and put it in the center of the sun. There's a whole ceremony involved in there too. I'm not going to say anything about that. That's sacred. For one thing, the tree is never supposed to touch the ground. So they're always carrying it. And when they bring it into the circle, traditionally they would put buffalo robes all over the ground and then they lay the tree there. Then they're going to get ready to put it in the hole that they've dug beforehand. But while it's laying down, the sun dancers are tying their ropes to the branches. That's their rope that they're going to use to pierce later. So then they raise the tree up. They also attach an effigy of a man and a buffalo. Because remember what I said earlier, humans and buffalo are very, very closely related because we evolved from the same creature. This is a sacred story. It's a sacred thing. So we're making our connection, our special connection to the earth with this. So they're displayed in a certain way to designate that connection to the earth. Because remember, the women already have that inside of themselves. But we have to do this So they make this buffalo and human effigy both displayed in a certain way that shows this connection too for us. Some people might tie prayer flags into the tree too. They have special prayers. Then they raise that tree. There's a song for that. They raise it and they fasten it. Get everything ready. Now the three days over, the four days of preparation is over. The next four days is going to be the dancing part. 
So they pierce either on the third or fourth day. And there's four ways to do that. They either pierce twice on the chest by attaching a rope to them and dance back away from the tree until the skin breaks. There's a certain process for that. I'm not going to give those instructions either. The second way is they pull buffalo skulls. They attach two things to their back and they pull buffalo skulls. They do this until the skin breaks. Third way is putting eagle claws up and down your arm, but I'm not going to say how many. And the fourth way, which I don't think today anybody has the guts to do it, is being pierced both in the front and back. They put four poles out there inside the circle, and then they pierce you in the chest and in the back, two places in front, two places in back, and you just hang there until you break. This is hard. Women already go through these things. Like I said, the ceremony is not for women because there's something that they have that they already go through. So we have to do these things. After the fourth day is over, then the dancers go away, but they still are separate from their families. There's four days of conclusion where they do more sweat lodge ceremonies and they slowly come out of the sun dance mindset and they slowly come back to the regular normal world. After the fourth day of conclusion, they join their families. So you see, they're away from their families a total of 12 days. During these four days is healing time for wherever they pierced. Also, there's a certain medicine for that. So when it's done, there's no scars. So a real sun dancer does not have scars. But if somebody shows off his scars to you, that means he's not real. He did do the ceremony, but he's not humble. Because if he was humble, he would have had the medicine. See, you have to know everything. When you prepare for the ceremony, you have to know every little thing that's involved with this, including the medicine you use to put on your wounds after that. So there's no scars. Nobody's supposed to know. The sacred. Imagine this. Would a woman walk around all day with her used tampon taped to her forehead and say, Ah, oh, look at me, I have my having my period. Would a woman do that? Maybe a crazy one would, but would a normal woman do that? No, of course not. In the Lakota world, this is sacred. You don't do that. So the same thing goes for a man. When he does the ceremony, he doesn't show off, and there's no scars. See, a lot of macho sun dancers today, that's what they do. They walk around with their shirts off and show off their scars and where they pierced to impress the girls. This is the same way as a woman putting a used tampon on her forehead and walking around saying, Yeah, look at me, guys. I'm 100% woman. Do you see the stupidity? So if you're a woman and you're looking for a sun dancer and you want a sun dancer boyfriend who has scars so you can show to your friends he's a sun dancer, you're like that woman who's walking around with a used tampon taped to her forehead every month. Because like attracts like. That's the second Lakota star knowledge concept. You see what I mean? So this is not something you brag about. It's not something you show off. So, before a man does the sun dance, one year before the ceremony, he has to do a crying for a vision ceremony, hamblecha. This is a four-day ceremony where he stands on the hill without food, without water, and cries for a vision. And to ask the wakantranka if he's supposed to sun dance that next year. Or he might say, I want to sun dance. So he has to ask in this Hamblecha ceremony. One year before, he wants to do it. And he might not get a vision. And if he doesn't, then he better not sun dance. He can try the Hamblecha next year. You don't just do it next week. You have to wait a whole year. That's the rule. But he may get a vision saying, yes, you're supposed to. And so then, 
He doesn't do it that year. There's a year of preparation. So if the answer is yes, then he has one year to make all the preparations. So he has to find an experienced person to help him. Every item that he needs, he has to get all of that together, including that medicine that you use to put on your wounds after it's over, after you pierce. These are the rules. But today, nobody does that. Instead, on the fourth day of the sun dance, today, you see people saying, yeah, I'm going to pledge to do it next year. They make a pledge. They never did this in the past. This is a recent thing that shows you we really lost a lot of our traditions. There's just very few of us who know this knowledge. So you didn't make a pledge. You did a humblecha ceremony. because. For every man, it's a different time. You don't do it when you're, okay, I'm 15 years old now, I'm a man, okay, now I'm supposed to do that. (laughs) It's not like that. It's different for everybody. It has nothing to do with our development because there's something inside of us that is different. Like I said, it has nothing to do with wisdom. It has nothing to do with development. It's just when it's ready, it's ready. When it's not, it's not. And that's not associated with how much you know. This is Lakota way. So, that's the thing that happened at this time. Anciently. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this video. And if you would like to send a special thanks, please look at the bottom of the video where you see the title of this video. And you see something like uh, the like button, and then it says dislike, share, slide that area towards the left. And you see some other buttons there. You see a download button, and then a thanks button, which is shaped like a heart. If you would like to send, a special thanks. You can click that thanks button and I would really appreciate the support for this channel. And I will see you in the next video. In our culture, everything is circular, so there's no word for goodbye. So instead, we say until next time, which in Lakota is Doksha. To learn more about Lakota spirituality, I have written a book called Wichocha Otehige. This book also includes Lakota star knowledge information. All the videos that I make, which are about Lakota spirituality, Lakota star knowledge, and cultural information, are based on this book. This book costs 99 American dollars. This price includes the shipping cost as well as a tracking number. And to learn more about Lakota language, I have written a Lakota language book called Chante Etanha Owoglake, Speaking from the Heart. And all my Lakota language videos are based on this book. This book costs 119 American dollars. This price includes the shipping cost as well as a tracking number. I also teach online and I give spiritual consultations as well. If you are interested in any of my services and products, you can send payment via PayPal to my email address, which is hechaka7 at yahoo.com. That's H-E-H-A-K-A, the number 7, at yahoo.com. When you send your payment, please include your shipping address 
and your email address. Ho, oh, lila pilamaelo. Thank you very much.